What's up, fam? So, yesterday, after our live session, uh, I tried to upload captions and subtitles. Uh, and in that process, I accidentally recorded our live uh, video, um, which makes me sad because um, participants had just so much gold to offer. Um, and I'm really grateful for folks that were there. I'm grateful for um, the folks that were interpreting for us. So Yaya um, and Laura, thank you so much. Uh, Lemni and Anhen, uh, thank you so much for interpreting our comments uh, for our Spanish speakers. Um, I'm going to upload this video with captions and subtitle onto Facebook, um, the root page and uh, my own personal page along with uh, the root website. I'll post information for that. Um, so you guys can view it uh, whenever it feels right for you. Um, so let me just talk a little bit about what this workshop um, is about. So this workshop, I, um, develop in collaboration with um, some beautiful folks. We usually offer it uh, before offering um, our Healing Cycles of Harm curriculum and training to give folks a taste of the work. Uh, I feel that uh, I've been seeing that a lot of folks, including myself, have been dealing with a lot of stuff coming up and surfacing um, as we're being told to shelter in place, um, as we're feeling, you know, let down by some of the lack of effort that, you know, our federal government um, is uh, enacting or not enacting um, to protect us. A lot has come up and I feel like really quickly um, and too, quick, too quickly for folks to process. Um, some of you guys may be noticing folks numbing out or yourself numbing out. Some of you folks may be noticing yourself um, a lot, a little bit more agitated or, you know, aggravated or other folks around you are feeling that way. Um, folks spending time, you know, alone, you know, at home, if you're used to engaging in the world as a way to like cope, um, some stuff might be coming up for you. Or if you're sharing space with like a lot of folks, um, it might be hard for you to deal with some of the stuff coming up. So folks are being impacted um, in different ways for different reasons. Um, but I think a lot of us are, are confused about some of the, you know, the discomfort that's coming up. It's like, why am I feeling this way? Right. Um, or what do I do about it? Right. Uh, you might know why, but you might want to figure out, well, how, how do I, how do I grapple with what's coming up? I don't have the tools. Right. Um, so part one of this workshop is to focus on self regulation, um, and coming to grounding when you're feeling emotionally charged. Um, and this step is really important before dealing with discomfort um, because, well, this is a accountability work, for, this ongoing accountability work for all of us, right? It's really difficult for us to deal with um, challenging situations with others within ourselves if we can't um, access our grounding, right? If we try to respond um, to challenging situations from a triggered place, then we're we take choice away from ourselves. And we'll talk about why that happens, right? Um, so it's important for us to um, develop some techniques to come, you know, into grounding. And then step two, or the second part of the workshop will, um, will invite folks to gently engage with discomfort and try out um, some tools to help you dialogue with that discomfort and understand um, and, and gain some wisdom from that discomfort that's coming to surface so that it doesn't overcome you so that, you know, it is in service of your own healing work, right? Um, as I mentioned before, this work um, was developed in a very collaborative space with Amy Paulson um, of Gratitude Alliance who does amazing work uh, democratizing healing, taking healing work, um, and not just like allowing experts to hold these tools for healing, but also sharing it with folks in community that need it. Um, and Tony Olivier, who has been um, educating young folks for 45 plus years in Oakland, California. He's an amazing artist, so many mediums and really good at, you know, just um, theater, visual arts, um, and I think really a healer in the work 
that he does, right? And, and I know a lot of folks in Oakland um, know Tony. He's an OG, right? And so I feel really blessed um, to have spent many nights, um, many dinners, many prayers, um, crying sessions, consulting with ancestors. Um, I really felt that creating this work has been a sacred process. And every time we come together, it feels like ceremony or even, you know, doing this work, recording in front of a camera, um, I feel um, their ancestors' work and energy, you know, come into the space. So I feel really thankful uh, for that. I feel thankful for my ancestors who have been, um, who have been with me through this journey. And I do this work to also send up healing, um, healing their trauma wounds as well. Um, I hope that you take the time to also acknowledge um, the work that has been done to allow you uh, the, po the possibility to do this work um, today, um, to be here today, to have the choices that you, know, you do have today. Um, I also acknowledge that this work is in conversation with um, the spirits and the, the ancestors of this land. This is, um, I'm currently in Oakland, California, unseated uh, Ohlone land. Um, and, <clears throat> and I feel very grateful and humbled um, to do this work here. And I'm hoping that this work is in service of, um, of those spirits, that energy and that community. Um, and thank you, thank you very much. Um, so just take some time to, you know, call in whoever you need to call in to thank um, for this work, right? Um, <clears throat> so, let's see. Looking at my notes. Uh, so two things that I want us to just kind of briefly practice um, before we engage in the bit of heaviness of this session today is one, to think of something that brings you joy. And this could be um, a memory, this could be a place, this could be a smell, could be a person, right? it could be a sound, just anything that brings you joy, right? And as you're thinking of that, notice what happens to your body. I noticed that my back, I just stood more erect, right? And I was thinking about um, my kids laugh. It brings me so much joy. It just fills me up, right? So think about that thing. I'm also noticing that my breath deepened, right? And that's another thing I want us to think about as a resource is your breath. Right? Your breath is a resource, allows you to come to center, right? Right. What my breath is helping me do right now is to deal with the awkwardness of talking to a camera. I'm just so used to talking to an audience and reading bodies and conversing with bodies and um, faces. Um, and this is kind of new for me. Um, I find it more awkward than doing a Facebook Live. Um, I, I definitely appreciate live a lot more now. Right? But you know, if you, if you see me take a deep breath as I'm trying to come to center myself, right? So the breath and then accessing that thought, right? It will bring you um, back to grounding um, is not only a useful tool for this workshop, right? These are tools that I wanna invite you guys to try out and use if you're feeling emotionally overwhelmed by the content. Um, but just also in day-to-day -day life, you know, when you're feeling um, emotionally overwhelmed by what's happening around you, um, so I think some of the tools we're going to talk about today will help you kind of like tap in and notice like, oh, I noticed A, B, and C are happening. Let me take a breath so that I can deal with the situation um, with more confidence and more choice, right? So use a session as a way to practice um, taking that breath. And as we move along, I think you'll understand the importance of that, right? Um, <clears throat> so I want to talk a little bit about somatic healing, um, which is a modality that we use um, for this work. Um, so most folks are familiar with cognitive behavioral therapy. Like when you go to a therapist and you talk about your, um, your memories, the issues, things that are coming up, 
um, the, the concept or the theory is that talking things out, um, having like a series of question and answers will help us think our way into healing, right? Um, and I don't want to um, necessarily like discredit um, our need to understand, you know, in our thinking mind what's going on, but I feel like there's, it's limited, right? You know, it's very limited, like kind of Western way of thinking about healing, right? Um, it misses the fact that our thinking minds are not the only parts of us that um, can record memory. Our bodies also record memory, right? Um, so even memory that you had before you were able to talk, that's also recorded onto your body, right? And we're still responding to those memories um, when something triggers those memories without us even knowing, right? So, you know, this work is really to like tap into that somatic memory um, and kind of know where those stories and those narratives um, are housed in our bodies. I'll talk about that in a sec, but let's try an experiment to try to understand um, how memories become locked in our bodies, right? So when you're feeling tension, um, in a situation, think about what you do with your body, right? Some people, like, they touch their ears or their hair, um, they play with their clothes, they cross their legs or they cross their arms or, you know, they sway, um, lean back, you know, think about what you do, right? For me, I do this, right? And there's a reason for this, right? I went to Catholic school um, back in 1980s, Harlem, um, 30 of us in a classroom, riled up, getting ready to go, end of day, um, teacher needed to calm us down. And one of the practices that they use is to have us, you know, fold our hands, put it on top of our old school wooden desk and just be quiet. And we would just sit there quiet for like, you know, five, 10 minutes quiet, right? Um, and we did this for eight years. And probably everyone in my class <laughs> has normalized this way of accessing quiet, right? Um, because over time, um, this pattern has been imprinted you know, into our bodies. And so now I notice, you know, if, if I'm in a situation and there's tension, you know, I tend to do this, right? Especially when I'm sitting down, right? Um, so if you're able to, I'm gonna invite you to cross your hands like this, right? Um, if you're not able to, then think about what your body already does to comfort itself and just feel into that, right? Um, if you're crossing your hands, I'm gonna ask you to uncross them shift one finger over and cross it again, right? So what does that feel like? For me, it feels awkward, right? This, there's a juxtaposition, right? It's like it fits, but not really. I feel like I have more fingers than I actually have, right? Um, someone in a live session mentioned, it feels like writing with my non-dominant hand, right? I thought that was a really great description, right? So if you're, if you're, um, if you're doing something else besides, you know, crossing your fingers, um, you know, try, if you're crossing your legs, for example, try crossing the other leg, right? Um, so try like adding like some kind of shift to what you normally do um, and feel that kind of like difference, right? So I want us to think about this as a metaphor, right? So the way I normally cross my fingers um, reminds me not just of, um, the way that my body has learned to access quiet, but also the way that my body has learned um, to relate to myself, to relate to other people, to relate to the world um, that may be positive, some that may be toxic, right? So all of those things are imprinted into my body, right? Especially if I've experienced the same ideas, the same notions, and heard the same things over and over and over again, you know, that can feel like this too, right? So we can um, familiarize our bodies with toxicity, right? And then um, if we try something different sometimes, right, that shift over and try a, a, a better way to, you know, relate to ourselves, a healthier way to relate to other folks, right? Sometimes it can feel awkward. Sometimes our bodies might feel like some kind of resistance, right? And, um, and our bodies might tell us like, why are we doing this? Like, this is not how we do relationship. This is not how we do self-talk. Like, let's go back to the thing that feels familiar. Like, this is too, too scary or um, this is just like awkward. This is not who we are, right? Um, and I want us to just kind of like, you know, notice when we're feeling, sometimes when we want to shift something, that might be difficult because of that, right? Because 
you know, we have like this like imprint in our bodies and then like doing the, the other thing, you know, we feel like we have less control over our situation and that can be scary, right? Um, sometimes like being in these toxic patterns feel um, like home for us, right? We're familiar with the, you know, the textures and the sounds of, you know, um, whatever that pattern might be for us. And right? we feel like this is the thing that we do. So we're going to do this, right? Um, and that's sometimes also why we tend to invite um, similar um, situations that in our thinking brains, we don't want and we say we don't want, right? Like, I don't want to ever be in that situation again, or, you know, I'm not going to raise my kid the way I was raised, or, you know, whatever that thing might be. But then we find ourselves repeating the same thing, right? Um, and we're going to talk about why this happens. Um, but a lot of that has to do with just us, like, this is just what we know, this is what we're familiar with, right? And we weren't given the models to do um, the other thing that we might, um, might find more healing in, right? So this is like a, kind of like a, um, an experiential way to understand um, what somatic healing is, right? Um, I want to pull up um, this text that kind of opened up life for me, um, Zora Neale Hurston's Their Eyes Are Watching God. Um, I think in this writing, there are just these beautiful moments where she, um, I think where she explains or exemplifies what somatic um, healing and resilience um, is before we, we ever like even before the, the the term was coined right so if you don't know about um this narrative um it's about uh jamie starks right who as a young girl was a very curious um girl right and she was beat she was raised by her grandma who was um very protective right um and when jamie um was a young an adolescent um she knew that she wanted um to have access to some kind of um joy in life she knew that there was something in life that she wasn't getting that she really wanted right some kind of like sensation some kind of dream and she uses the horizon um as a metaphor for that this thing that's kind of like out there that we you know this beautiful thing that you know we we can walk towards right um but that's not readily tangible for us right now, right? Um, and she um, she wonders about you know this this thing, um, this dream, right? As in as she surrounds herself, you know, in nature, right? And she's kind of like you know in the space, her grandma's backyard, and like wondering like you know what is it? What is it that's that's out there that I don't have access to? Like I want that thing, right? Um, and so as a young girl, as her grandma's, you know, uh, becoming older, she's worried about uh, Jamie being protected, right? And so she arranges a marriage um, with somebody else that owns land, right, and is a farmer. Um, and Jamie in this first marriage feels very unsatisfied because, you know, this, this dude doesn't cut it up for her, right? She's like, I'm not feeling all the feelings I want to feel. Like, grandma, what's wrong with me? Like, you know, and grandma is more um, preoccupied with her safety, right? Um, not with this, this frivolous little dream that Janie's talking about, right? Um, but that dream is important to Janie, right? So much so that she leaves this man um, and she meets uh, Joe Starks, right? And um, she marries him in the hopes that, well, you know, this is something different than grandma, than living with grandma, than living with this, this first you know, husband Logan, right? Um, that was his name. Um, and she, um, she becomes married to him and he becomes a mayor of, um, of this new city um, or town, Eatonville, right? Um, and over time, she starts to um, notice that he is not interested in Janie's internal life very much, right? In fact, he does um, a lot to try to limit where she can speak, how much she can speak, um, to who she can speak to. Um, and uh, years into the marriage, she cooks up a meal um, and 
the meal doesn't come up right and he smacks her right and something hits her in that moment right um so um i want to read and i can post a, a snapshot of this paragraph um, and post it on on social media where i post this video if you have the book this version is on page 72. so this is a moment where things just kind of like snap for her right she stood where he left her for unmeasured time and thought and she stood there until something fell off the shelf inside her then she went inside there to see what it was it was her image of jody as her husband tumbled down and shattered but looking at it she saw that it never was the flesh and blood figure of her dreams just something she grabbed up to drape her dreams over in a way, she turned her back upon the image where it lay and looked further. She had no more blossomy openings dusting pollen over her man, neither any glistening young fruit where the petals used to be. She found that she had lost, that she had a host of thoughts she had never expressed to him and numerous emotions she had never let Jody know about. Things packed up and put away in parts of her heart where he could never find them. She was saving up feelings for some man she had never seen. She had an inside and an outside now, and suddenly she knew how not to mix them, right? So I feel like here in this paragraph, Zora Neale Hurston wonderfully, I think, captures what the body can do um, to protect itself, um, and to practice some form of resilience here. So she's talking about Jamie knowing that there's this part of her, this inter internal world that is very special to her. And she is kind of creating a room or a space within herself to hold that part of her identity, right? That's her inside part, right? And she's going to keep that protected um, and show up in the world differently. So that's her outside part, right? And this is a practice of self-preservation for Jamie, right? Eventually, when she's ready, um, she allows that inside part out and her outside part and inside part become consistent, right? But she knew her, somehow her body figured out that it needed to do this to protect itself just for the moment, right? Um, and that's part of what we're going to talk about today is like what our body does to protect ourselves, right? I want to backtrack for a second. Why are we talking about... Um, the body why are we talking about individual healing some of us might be thinking the problem is not in me right the problem is in our institutions of power the problem is like you know poverty and racism and that's true right um but this is not a case of um of one or the other right some of us are thinking well um like what's supposed to what are we supposed to like attend to first is it our individual healing or is it institutional change Right? Is it our school systems that need to change? Um, our, uh, our punitive systems that need to be uh, obliterated, right? Um, what needs to happen first, right? Um, I want to argue that we can't do one without the other, right? I want to talk about why here, right? Um, so I mentioned that our bodies record memory, right? So over time, when we experience um, memory or moments um, in these institutions that we engage with, right? Schools, right? Um, our economy, whatever our jobs are, whatever our parents, you know, the work that they've done, right? We learn and engage in these systems over the course of our lives. And there's certain like patterns and ways of like showing up in these spaces that become recorded into our bodies, right? Um, and, and this does affect different bodies um, differently, right? Bodies of color, for example, might engage in some of these systems and feel that they don't have a say because um because we've been told so right um for example the medical industrial complex right um i think that many of us have heard about how um, black women in particular um have been or aren't believed when they tell their doctors that they're in pain right um and what that happens to us is that we then normalize pain like oh it's just nothing um, or I should just, you know, sit it through, you know, pop, you know, some Advil, there's nothing really going on until, you know, over time, we realize that we've been dealing with something quite serious for some time. And this actually happened to me where I survived appendicitis for 30 days 
after visiting doctors, after visiting emergency, nobody wanted to believe that my appendix was leaking, right? And I could have died. Luckily, you know, I think I feel like my higher power is looking over me, ancestors looking over me. Um, but I think this is a great example of how um, we have been taught to not advocate for ourselves, right? And how, you know, and, and this is, can be different experience, you know, for different folks, right? Disabled bodies, you know, are, um, are not, you know, have to do a lot of work to show up in these spaces and, and be seen, you know, in certain spaces and, you know, to be able to engage authentically in these spaces, right? Um, and there's a lot of like recording onto the body that happens um, punitive systems, right? This is not just something that impacts folks in um, uh, in the prison industrial complex, but we have like patterns of like punitive um, engagement in all of these, you know, systems, you know, and it, and, and it starts early, you know, with schools or within our households, right? Um, a way to like kind of control a child's behavior um, is oftentimes we're taught to use punishment, right? And shaming, right? Um, and these become recorded in our bodies and we think, oh, well, there is nothing wrong. Like, this is just what it is. Right. Um, and, um, so the point that I want to make with this is that, yes, these systems of power perpetuate harm, perpetuate violence. Right. But they're not just out there. They're also in us. They're also housed in us. Right. Um, and so if this is the case, then how are we going to create um, ways of relating to other folks? How are we going to create new social structures um, that, um, that enable healing capacity, that create healing capacity, right? If um, the patterns that we have stored in our bodies um, are actually um, ref a reflection of the kind of systems that we're trying to move against, right? Um, it's really hard for us to do that. And it's really hard for us to see how we're replicating these patterns in our relationship to others and even to ourselves, right? Um, so this is why the work um, that I'm doing is really focused on like, where are, these, where are these things housed, you know, in our bodies, right? And how can I work through this so that then um, I can show up as a resource um, to myself um, and to the world, right? Um, so this is why we're focused on, um, on individual healing. And yes, this can happen, um, I think, as we're doing work outside in the world and doing institutional healing as well, right? Um, okay. So one of the tools that I want to introduce help us, you know, just start noticing what's happening in our bodies is tracking, right? And this is a tool that was introduced to me by Amy Paulson, and I thank her for it because it's a simple way to communicate something that may be really complex in our bodies, right? So when somebody asks you, so how are you feeling? <laughs> Sometimes we resort to saying, oh, I'm fine, right? Um, because and without even like really tapping into how we're feeling. And that's because we live in a culture that doesn't um, invite us to um, really take the time to have a relationship with what's going on in our bodies, right? So <coughs> um, tracking is a way for us to kind of slow time down and think about well, what's happening in my mind, what's happening in my body, what's happening in my heart, right? Um, this is so that we respond to situations from a place of knowing, right? Um, not a reactive response, right? Um, so when we think about tracking, um, we, use, um, we use a scale of one to 10 to communicate how it is that you're feeling, right? Um, so you can have a different number for these different parts of you, right? Um, and this kind of helps us understand and get closer to understanding of what, what's actually going on in my body, right? So let's start with the mind, right? If you're feeling um, anywhere between a one to five, you might feel worried, you might have some racing thoughts, you might have foggy brain, or you might feel cluttered or distracted, right? That's on the lower end of the scale. On the higher end of the scale, five to 10, you might feel focused, um, your thinking is clear, you're able to discern, make decisions, right? So think about right now in your thinking brain, 
right? In your mind, where are you on this scale from one to 10, right? Right now, I'm feeling, I would say maybe a six, right? Because I'm still very cognizant of the fact that I'm talking to um, a video, right? Um, and I'm really hungry for engagement and interaction, right? So being mindful of that is really important because then we can make decisions based on that awareness, right? So I know that breathing for me is going to help me think about um, where this work is going, the importance of this work, and then why I'm here and why I'm doing this. And then this, you know, the awkwardness of this whole situation um, really doesn't compare, right, to that purpose. So I'm just going to let the awkwardness be, right? And I'm just going to keep talking and doing right now body if you're on the lower end of the scale one to five you might be feeling pain stiffness fatigue you might need to use a bathroom you might have like a tummy ache a headache right um if you're on a higher end of the scale you might be feeling more relaxed healthy active alive fluid um i had a good smoothie this morning that's still holding me up so i feel like that comfortable like fullness in my body um i had a good sleep last night so i don't feel like any of the usual pains that i'd be feeling so i would say i'm at a like a seven right because i'm also a little bit like i have like energy in me like i want to move i want to not like sit down right um so i'm gonna i'm gonna go i'm gonna do some exercise after this so and no so right there already i'm tapping into what my body is feeling, um, and, I, and I'm able to like identify a need, like I need to move, right? And I can make a decision to kind of bring me to like a higher number, right? Um, in your heart, you are on a low, the lower end of the scale. If you're feeling numb, disconnected from others, emotionally closed, um, or if you're feeling like anger or intense fear, um, I don't know if you can see this, if you're feeling anger or intense fear, um, which will bring you into a stress response, which we'll talk about later, right? Um, so generally, like, if you're just, like, kind of disconnected from folks is when you're at a lower end of the scale um, in terms of heart. Um, you're at the higher end of the scale if you're feeling connected, emotionally open, um, loving, or even if you're sad or hurt because it means that you're still engaged, emotionally engaged and connected, right? Um, and this work, just, like, engaging in this work makes me feel um emotionally connected so when i'm doing this work I'm, I'm always like at the higher end of the scale here right so you can think about your number for each of these parts um and you can um if you're using this um in in a shared space which you're welcome to um you can ask folks to kind of like round their number right or you can if you have time have them give you a number for each of these things but you know it's a really helpful tool just for yourself too to think about to check in with yourself and ask yourself what do i need do i need to take a deep breath <sighs> take a couple of deep breaths right um do i need to slow my talking down probably so i didn't even notice i was talking faster than i normally do right so um, that's one tool that you can utilize um, throughout uh, this workshop. And I also want us to just practice this. If you're going to do session two of this workshop, practice this throughout the next couple of days um, before you engage in session two, right? Um, and then notice what happens when you're um, feeling, when you're engaging in a very like emotionally challenging moment um, after doing this for some time. How does your body respond to that challenging moment, right? After you kind of like, kind of like hacking into your body um, and, and having a different and teaching yourself your body to have a different response to um, physical and emotional discomfort, right? Um, after your body has practiced this for some time, notice how you respond over time, how you respond to um, discomfort, right? Um, so speaking of discomfort, let's talk about trauma and what happens to trauma, or what happens to the brain when it experiences trauma, okay? So let's, 
well, what is trauma first? So trauma is when the body experiences way too much intensity, way too quickly for you to make sense of what's going on, right? Um, and trauma is, can be experienced differently for um, different people. Um, two people can experience the same thing and um, each of these people can have different responses. One person may feel traumatized and the other person may not. Um, so trauma is a very personal kind of, you know, experience. Only the, the person can tell you if something was traumatic for them, right? Um, <clears throat> I, I remember seeing a post um, that I thought explained the, um, I think the silliness around comparing trauma really well. Um, and it described um, two people drowning in water, right? So one person drowns. In, in six feet of water and, and another person drowns in like 25 feet of water, right? Um, you can't really compare the two experiences, right? If you drown, you drown, right? It doesn't matter how deep the water is. One person didn't um, drown more traumatically than the other one or die more traumatically than the other one. Both people experience um, drowning, right? So that's another thing that we don't wanna do is to experience people's traumas, right? or to, I'm sorry, to compare people's traumas, right? Um, so um, trauma is, a, is an experience that the body has. It's not a, an event, right, necessarily that happens. It's the way the body responds to an event, right? So what happens to the brain when we experience trauma? Um, I'm gonna invite you to do another hand exercise and just like fold your thumb over and then uh, place your four fingers over that if you can. Right? And imagine that this is your brain, right? Um, the front of your brain, the forehead, right, is this part right here. It's called the neocortex, the thinking brain, right? Um, so it's located behind the forehead, and it's the part that um, controls our rational thought, our, you know, decision-making, our speech, our ability to, like, you know, do math problems, right, to problem-solve, abstract thought. Right, and this is like the newest part of our brain. Right, this is the more like um, yeah, the newest part of our brain, um, and we share this part of our brain um, less uh, than this other part of our brain, which is um, the reptilian, right, part of our brain. This is the oldest part of our brain. It's the ancient part, right? Um, it sits atop of the spinal column, right, and this part lacks rational thought. Um, it, it lacks logical thought. Um, we need this part of the brain to kind of like help us make sense of the situation to think critically about situations, right? This part of the brain um, doesn't do that. And this is a part of a brain that we share um, with most animals, right? It's, it's the oldest part of our brain. It also controls our reflexive behaviors, muscle control, Breathing at night when you're asleep, um, digestion, right? So things that you don't consciously control, but that our body know, knows how to do in order to keep us alive. Um, this part of our brain um, is active, right, when it comes to that. And then um, in here, we have like the limbic system, which is the emotional part of our brain, right? And this sits like deep in the center of the brain. This part of our brain does not control time or logic. Um, it controls emotion pleasure, memory, motivation, and um, safety. Like it's scanning for danger, even when we're not aware. Um, this is the part of the brain that is always looking for a threat, right? Um, and this part of our brain may, may register something as a threat, whether it's actually a threat or not. It, does, it, it doesn't engage the thinking part of the brain um, that can distinguish whether it's an actual threat or not. It's just like, threat, oh, you know, time to, you know, time to respond. And it knows only three responses, fight, flight, or freeze, right? And what happens to our brains is that when it senses a threat is that our thinking brains go offline, right? So we no longer have access to rational thought, only fight, flight, or freeze, right? This is important for us to know, um, especially because sometimes when we respond um, by fighting or running away or freezing, um, there's a lot of shame involved in our responses, right? I bet you that um, you've probably been in a situation where you were experiencing some kind of like tension um, or you, maybe you were in an argument with somebody and, um, and you wish 
that you had responded differently. Like, oh, I wish I would have like said this or I would have done that. Or, you know, why did I respond that way? Or why didn't I do anything? Or what did I do too much? Or I wish I didn't say that, that thing or the other thing. And that's because our thinking brain was offline, right? Um, and knowing this helps us like release shame around those responses, right? And it helps us understand how other people are responding when they're feeling triggered. And it helps us understand like, oh, it looks like something triggered that person. Um, so I'm going to engage in a situation differently because this is really not about me. This is about what they're experiencing right now. Um, so you can choose to engage or disengage based on that knowledge, right? Um, but it helps, it helps you um, also um, acknowledge when you're feeling triggered, right? Um, so after having this information and you see yourself fight, fighting or running away or freezing, you can um, recognize and say, oh, something bothered me. Like something, like something hit a button in me, right? So let's talk about what fight, flight, and freeze actually looks like, right? So these are protective responses. Some people call them trigger responses, but um, I like to call them protective responses because these responses are also what our ancestors have practiced that make it possible for us to be alive today, right? Um, you know, at some point in the past, our ancestors needed to know how to do these things in order to literally stay alive, right? So give thanks for these responses. Give thanks for our body's ability to protect itself, right? So what does fight look like? Fight looks like actually fighting, right? Throwing up your fists, um, shouting, aggression, explosive anger, obsessive com uh, competitiveness, right? These are ways that um, fighting happens. And, and I want us to think of these responses not just as external responses, um, but also internal responses. So we can turn these things inward into ourselves. So think about how you talk to yourself, right? Um, flight can look like literally running away or avoiding situations, avoiding people, avoiding places, storming out. Um, it can look like fear of commitment, phobias, panic attacks, right? All of these things are examples of flight. And freeze is what happens when we, um, when these two, fight and flight, become inaccessible, right? So in situations where, you know, you can't escape the danger and the only thing that you're, that you can do that your mind knows how to do is just kind of check out and just like run away without physically running away, right? And just pretend that it's not happening. Um, it's a way to cope with um, physical pain, right? Is to just kind of check out, right? Um, so what does that look like? It might look like blank stares, right? It might look like daydreaming. It might look like numbing out, right? And this is important for us to know, especially when we're caring for others. Um, oftentimes, like in a classroom, the student that's also, that's always quiet, um, doesn't get the care and attention that they need. Um, and oftentimes this is because they're not a behavioral problem in the classroom, right? And the louder students get more, you know, the attention and the care um, and curiosity around what's happening with them. Um, and we might not be aware that the quiet person in the classroom might be triggered, right? Might be experiencing some kind of perceived or maybe a real threat, right, in the classroom, right? And when we're talking about threat, um, it, we're not just talking about physical threat. Um, a threat can be a threat to the ego, an injury to the ego, an injury to the emotional self as well, right? Um, so these kinds of um, things are important to be, you know, important for us to be aware of when we're talking about um, caring for others or caring for ourselves too, right? Um, so again, shame is often associated with like these responses, um, but it's really just our brains knowing, like doing what it knows how to do to take care of itself, right? So the problem is or not the problem but um i think the response to this is um 
is to think about, okay, so when I'm feeling these responses, what can I do to bring my thinking brain back on so that I'm not responding from this place, right? And when we're responding from this place, um, I want to be clear that we may be responding to an actual, um, an actual real threat that's happening, right? A real a situation that's actually dangerous in the moment in time. Or there might be like a sound or a word or a movement that somebody did that calls in um, that memory that was a trauma, you know, for yourself, right? Um, so what happens to the brain is that it thinks that it's experiencing the same thing again and it's saying, oh no, it's happening again we need to we need to act right um and so what we end up doing is to, we do some time travel right and we are responding to the past not to the present right so what we want is to have access to choice when we're dealing with difficult situations right so what can we do to bring the thinking brain back online so that we can respond with choice right and so that we don't respond with um harm right to ourselves or to others right um so i want us to talk about a practice <laughs> um okay so many folks know what coping means right coping strategies right when you think of coping strategies what do you think about what comes to mind Right. I'm going to pull up some of the things that our participants um, came up with when we had the live session, right? So coping are these kind of like short term, like kind of quick responses to discomfort, right? Or a tough situation, right? Um, this might include drinking, self-harm, right? Cutting or overexertion if you exercise. Exercising is great and it's healthy. Um, but sometimes we might like push ourselves so hard and it might be like a, like a fight, you know, kind of um, a way to fight with ourselves, right? Um, as a way to kind of like resolve whatever it is that, that we might be experiencing. Um, sleep is another coping strategy. Um, OD and on Netflix, do, like overdoing it, um, over controlling things, stress shopping, too much TV, reckless sex, um stress eating right driving fast uh uh obsessive news reading or watching right yelling a way to just kind of like quickly like Ugh, i want to like release this thing right i want to like get it out of me and make it you know feel better or or run away and numb out right you notice how like some of these like coping strategies also align with some of our um protective responses too which is interesting right um, but these are things that we do in the moment to kind of like resolve whatever that tension is. And some of these coping strategies can sometimes be um, healthy and sometimes not healthy. So sometimes we need coping strategies to help us like just kind of get through the moment, right? Um, sometimes we need to like run to the bathroom and cry and then come back to the situation and deal with it, right? Or sometimes, you know, we need to, you know, whatever it is that you need to do in the moment to kind of like just continue functioning um, in the world, it's okay, right? Um, just as long as you're not harming yourself or somebody else, right? Um, and resourcing is um, a lot different than coping, right? So resourcing is what we do, um, in, uh, in some kind of ongoing or continuous way, something that we, um, that might be a ritual or a pattern for us that we create for ourselves to teach our bodies to like access grounding, right? And again, this is really important um, for our bodies to know how to do that so that we can bring our thinking brains on um, much quicker than we normally would, right? Um, and resourcing, again, I consider that accountability work. In really important accountability work um, because um, we can't um, again we can't respond from a place of integrity and choice if we're feeling triggered right so this is work that's necessary for us to do 
um, it's actually necessary for us to not live in like a quick world. We don't make time to, for self care. Um, it's really important for us to practice resourcing, right? Um, so that we can build the kind of like social structures that we want to build, right? Um, so some examples of that is, you know, exercising, um, making that a pattern. Like I know for myself, if I don't exercise regularly, like I, I don't like myself. I don't like, and I don't think people like me very much either. Like I can't, it, it's really hard for me to, um, it's really hard for me to, it's really easy for me to get annoyed. It's really easy for me to like, you know, you know, kind of like be quick like with people, if I don't exercise, like my tolerance level is like, I just can't, right? Um, I have more capacity, more compassion for folks and for myself if I exercise on a regular basis. So I'm, I treat exercise like it's my job. I show up to that because it's important for me to do that, right? And it makes me feel hella good, like after I do it and I'm while I'm doing it too, right? I feel like I'm winning, right? Going for walks regularly, as an example, taking bubble baths on a regular basis, an example, meditation, right? Um, visualization, meditation, accessing quiet, doing breathing exercises on a regular basis. Um, so again, these are all examples, ways for you to train your body and teach your body how to access grounding, right? Um, painting, writing, right? Um, cooking, playing instruments, right? Um, listening to music, you know, reading, connecting with plants, um, smells, incense, right? So paying attention to those things, things that will help you kind of just slow down time um, and just like notice, you know, what's around you, notice what's happening in your body and do something that makes your body feel good and grounded and calm, right? Um, dance, right? Or talking to someone, maybe you see, you know, a therapist or you're part of a support group on an ongoing basis and, you know, just feeling like validated and, you know, connected and making space and time for that connection, right? So these are all examples of resourcing. And I want to invite folks to think about before engaging in session two, to think about like one or two things that you can do to resource and try try them out like every day. Try something out every day, right? And it doesn't have to be so extravagant, right? It can be like, I'm just gonna wake up um, 30 minutes early and just have my cup of tea and just look out the window. Like, and just hear the birds or whatever you see, whatever sky you see out the window. Um, or if you have a plant, I'm just gonna like, just sit with this plant for like 30 minutes or I'm gonna journal or I'm just gonna breathe, you know, I'm going to um, just access some kind of quiet or 30 minutes before going to bed, something, you know, easy, or I'm gonna go for a walk um, after my lunch, you know, something that's, you know, easy for you to access. Don't make it too hard initially because what, what happens often is that when we try to create like major change too quickly, it's, it's easier <laughs> for us to give up and it's harder for us to have, um, patience and compassion for ourselves. So try something out and then notice what happens throughout that day where you practice that. What happens um, when something challenging comes your way, right? Um, so, you know, I want to, I want to reiterate that because we're like focusing on grounding and regulating, right? This is a tool to help us move to step two, right? So the goal is not necessarily to always be like in this like, la la la, like happy space all the time. Like, yes, it's nice, but life is going to be life. Life is going to throw all kinds of shit at you, right? You want to be ready, right? And this, these are the tools that you're going to need to be ready to respond to that discomfort, right? But we can't skip this step, right? We have to, you know, kind of like, if you're into this, like, you know, build whatever tools or ammunition you need to be able to deal with this. And sometimes ammunition doesn't look like, you know, a bullet it doesn't look like something violent. Sometimes ammunition really just looks like this, like, you know, just like creating this sense of like self empowerment and, and grounding, right? So when you come up against something, it's really hard for um, that thing to like knock you down, right? Um, and it took me an enormous amount of time to 
become the person that doesn't get easily triggered by um, certain things that used to trigger me, certain relationships with certain people um, that used to trigger me. It takes a lot of work to really build up to that, right? A lot of practice. So just start little by little and just start noticing the little things, right? Um, and then I think as you start to notice um, the smaller changes, um, the more you start to, the more your body starts to open up and create more possibility, right? And the more you want to practice resourcing, and then you get to be more expansive and imaginative with how you practice resourcing. And for me, it's, it's like, this is my, this is, this is the work that saves my life, right? This is what makes living life the way I want to live it more possible, right? So that my trauma is not going to overcome me and control me, right? Okay, so I want to end with an embodied um, meditation, a visualization. And this one I'm borrowing from Sage Hayes, who um, had this amazing workshop, um, part of a conference. Uh, 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 what was the name of the conference? Embodied, embodied Healing Conference. I will post a link. Um, to that conference because there's some really great information on there if you're more interested in somatic healing um, and I will tag Sage Hayes on this but this one is um, this one is on embodied freedom and it's a tool that you can use um, as one of your resourcing practices if you want to kind of like activate your resilience right um, and it's one that helps you tap into your compassion as well right compassion for self gratitude right gratitude so um this visualization is gonna um invite you to engage with your um, ancestors so do some time traveling um and with the future right so <clears throat> try to access a place where it's relatively quiet and you feel comfortable with either lowering your gaze or closing your eyes or if you want to pause the video and put some like white noise on, I like to, you know, throw on my, my calm app or YouTube, um, white noise, the ocean, rain or whatever, um, and play that in the background if you want. Right. So just take a couple of breaths and just notice what your body is feeling without judgment, right. Without, needing to feel like you need to fix anything, like just notice, you know, if you're sitting down, notice the weight of your body against the seat. If your feet are on the ground, then just kind of like notice, just be aware of the bottom of your feet against whatever texture it's on. It could be a sock, could be the ground, carpet, whatever that might be. We'll take some deep breaths. Notice the muscles in your legs. Notice your hip. If there's tension anywhere between your feet and your hip. You just come aware of that. If you want to move around and you can. You don't have to. And just notice your belly. How deep or shallow is your breath right now? If you were to put your hand on your belly, if you're sitting up, lying down, try to notice where your breath is. And become aware of your back. Also, your slouching, just kind of notice where your shoulders are, your spine, if it's curved anywhere. And your arms, what are your arms doing? What are your hands doing? Are you holding on to tension anywhere on your chest? Your throat, shoulder, where is your tongue in your mouth? And then 
there's tension on your face. Just notice that too. How do your eyelids feel against your eyes? Eyebrows. Become aware of your scalp. And if you need to adjust anything, you know, do what you want, do what feels good, do what feels right. right? It's about awareness. And so now I want us to imagine 50 years back, 500 years back, 5,000 years back, 50,000, 500,000, a being could be a person or an animal, but just a being could be someone you know, someone you don't know, <clears throat> that because of the choices that they made has made it possible for you to be here today, has made it possible for you to have the choices that you have. So just imagine that being, just take a look at them and Notice the environment, notice what they're doing. Just gain an awareness of that choice or those choices that they made. And as you're becoming aware of and engaging in whatever those choices are, notice how your body feels as you're witnessing them. And you can engage with them to the extent that feels comfortable. You can say hello. Maybe they have something to share with you, some piece of wisdom they have for you. So perhaps listen in and notice what they have to say. What do they have to offer? So whatever it is, that gift, that piece of wisdom that they have to give you, take it in and drop it somewhere in your body, wherever it feels right. Take it with you, thank them for that wisdom. Thank them for their choices. We're gonna travel back to the present. Let's take a deep breath in the present moment. Now we're gonna journey into the future. This could be 50 years, 500, 5,000 years into that future. Whatever feels right for you is the right amount of distance and time. Now we're going to imagine a being in that future. Could be a grandchild, a great, 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 great grandchild, right? Or it could be any being in that future that because of the choices that you have made, in the present time that that person or being is able to have a life, is able to have the choices that they have. Let's take some time to notice the wonderful choices that they have, the life that they're willing, that they're able to lead Notice what they're doing, where they are. You can say hello. And just feel into those, those small and big like ripple effects that begin with your choices and reach them, right? The small acts of love, right? the, the big, brave choices that you've made, the chances that you've taken. 
all to give this person choice and access to the life they have. Feel into that connection with this being, this person. And perhaps this person or being has something to tell you. Just listen in and see what they have to say. And so whatever piece of information they have for you, drop it into your body wherever it feels right. And thank them for that piece of knowledge, for their engagement with you, for checking in. Right? And then take a deep breath, a journey back into the present. Whenever it feels right, you can open your eyes and just notice what's around you, notice your environment, come back to the present, and just notice what your body feels. So whatever knowledge or wisdom it is that you've gained in this visualization. Um, that medicine is for you um, to use uh, and share in your practice with yourself, with others. Um, just sit on it and see, um, try to be curious about what um, comes up or the relevancy of um, that information as you engage in the practice of resourcing Right, of coming to center, um, continuing your healing journey, because this is just a part of a longer journey that, um, that you've already started. And these are just some offerings, some tools um, for you to take with you um, as you continue your journey forward. Okay? So thank you so much for engaging. Um, again, you may feel like you need more time to practice, you know, this resourcing uh, before you engage in session two. Um, it's all up to you. Take your time. You know, there's no rush. Healing is a slow, ongoing journey. Um, this Friday, I will um, go live again at five o'clock. We will have our interpreters with us again. So if you know anybody um, that needs access to this work, please share this video with them. Um, I'm also going to post um, a resource, uh, Lemni, Dr. Lem. Um, she is a somatic healer and she is offering some free one-on-one -on -one support for folks that are um, struggling with uh, trying times today and um, struggling with this huge shift. Um, I'm going to post a flyer with some of her information, some of her work. Also, uh, Candice Valenzuela is also has been offering um, some really good framing around um, what's what's happening, what's come up. Um, so if you're interested in that, I'll also post up um, her workshop um, as well. Um, you can stay connected. You can email me if anything comes up for you um, because of this, this video, this workshop. I will post contact info. Um, and thank you. I appreciate and um, am grateful for your healing journey. Um, I strongly, strongly believe that my healing journey is deeply connected to your um, healing journey. And I, as Candice uh, said in her workshop today, I also agree um, that healing is um, collective work as well. As, as much as it is individual work, it's also collective work. And um, for me, it's been powerful, these workshops, um, collective workshops with others have been really powerful um, experience for me as a facilitator um, or a facil uh, facilitant <laughs> because I very much feel like this work is alive for me as well 
um, it's important for our healing journey to also be validated and reflected back onto us. I feel like it deepens the experience. Um, so if you're engaging in this healing journey, healing work with others, um, I think you're doing uh, great work and I highly encourage that. Um, and I'll also be, if you stay connected and stay tuned, I'll also be posting um, additional collective healing opportunities um, that you can engage in. Okay. All right. So be safe and be well, y'all.